Greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal Hill, Aaron's Van Sale. And tonight we're discussing a very a deceptively simple question, but I think we're going to get some interesting answers and some interesting insights regarding it. It all started back when uh, Russell Lamberti was on my show uh, a few months ago. And uh, we were actually talking about a completely different topic. Uh, but then uh, we were talking actually about the economic and political principles in the Bible. Uh, but then somehow the conversation went towards the ANC and why uh, it still has a very strong voter base. And uh, Russell touched on it. And I saw when he started talking about it, he had a little bit of a mischievous twinkle in his eye as if he had something on his heart that he wanted to share. So I said that's going to be a conversation for another day. So I invited him back on. I also got uh, Mr. Digan uh, on here to join us for this conversation and to add some more insights. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thanks, man. Great to be here. All right. Yeah. So uh, it seems like the, the internet in South Africa is actually of a better quality than uh, over there in the Netherlands, Rob. It would seem so. Last house on the block to get fiber, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, but it's a rental, so it's not going to get it's not going to get fiber. Mm. Uh. All right, so uh, let's just jump into the meat of it, and I think we're going to start with you, Russell. So, uh, our conversation—I can't remember how we got there, but it pretty much veered into the the topic of what drives a voter base and specifically in South Africa, a question that a lot of political analysts have tackled is why do people vote for the ANC? Now, a lot of people, when I advertised this uh, episode, had their own opinions. A lot of them very sure about uh, what they think is going on, but uh, something that we see a lot of political analysts and journalists and uh, common commentators in South Africa be perplexed about is no matter how corrupt or inefficient or just scoundrelly the ANC behaves or conducts itself, it still maintains a very strong voter base and still has a very firm grip on power. So why don't you guide us into that uh, answering of that question in regards to why do we still see the strong ANC voter base around and uh, what does that say about it, uh, the trends for the future? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it's obviously a very, in one sense, a hugely trying to provide um, analysis on, you know, millions and millions of voters who, who of course, have many different reasons for for voting for the ANC. Um, the, and, and I think you could probably break the answer down into, into, into a whole bunch of, um, I, I suppose, what you might call very practical maybe almost mechanical reasons um ways in which in which ruling parties secure ongoing support you know things like um creating a huge dependency ratio on the state uh, providing huge welfare payments uh, employing millions and millions of people in the state apparatus so those are those are obviously some some of the proximate reasons for how the ANC is able to to secure ongoing support. You can then talk about legacy issues, about the the place that the ANC holds in in the South African body politic um, as this hugely famous and influential liberation organization. Um, and you can also talk about how the ANC, under the ANC's watch, uh, many South Africans, many South African people's lives have improved. Um, whether that improvement is sustainable, whether it's coming at the expense of other South Africans is sort of a secondary question for many people. Um, so these are all, you know, ways to take a stab at the answer. Um, and of course, it's, it's something that requires a lot of rigor. Um, but I think the, the the real point that I would like to drive at, and I think where this discussion will bear fruit, in, in my mind, is is to talk about the identitarian nature of of South African political life. Um, you have a whole lot of people telling us to to run away to 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 run away from identity politics, um, and you know whatever your normative um, prescriptive you know view on that on that is the, the fact is that politics is about identity it is about um the protection of culture it is about um 
securing um, a place of belonging in in the political sphere and negotiating that cultural um, belonging um, in a very complicated world of competing economic and cultural interests. Um, and so to, to suggest that that politics taking on the form of identity is somehow you know evidence of of great ideological um dysfunction or moral failure i think i think gets it wrong i think i think the sooner we understand that identity is a is a major underpinning force and a major driver of 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 political life um, the better. And so I think where I wanted to drive this is to say that a huge part of of ANC support, EFF support, DA support, IFP support, um, these things these things come from deep cultural and identitarian roots. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they have such stickability. It's one of the reasons why they persist in the face of what um, rationalists see as kind of very irrational, behavior what how could you possibly vote for jacob zuma how could you possibly vote for you know this or that leader um but people are playing a, a different kind of game to the typical um cosmopolitan you know liberal who's 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 standing aloft all this and and looking at it uh, with, with very different goggles and, and and lenses on and um i think the sooner we realize that um the better so that's my sort of opening salvo rob mm -hmm. might want to come in there but uh that's that's sort of the broad direction that I I would like to explore in this in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, Rob, do you think uh, Russell's moving in the right direction, or what's your take on the issue? Well, I mean, I think like part of the problem is most people the, like if you look at black commentators, they don't really ask that this question ever. They don't ask why are people voting for the NC. It's it's almost like well, they know why people are voting for the NC. It's 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 sort of a background sort of a background assumption and i think the reason that we're even asking the question is that we're stuck with western institutional biases now the western idea particularly the anglophone idea is that you have two parties or at least two wings of the political process and they yank each other backwards and forwards and um, create a sort of progressive ratchet um, over time um, and th there's sort of these alternatives and what we do is we figure out uh, which policies, which ideas to follow on a sort of like partial and incremental basis by looking at like, well, you know, uh, a, a dialogue. But most of the rest of the world doesn't look at these things this way. They, they support regimes. And I mean, you, you can look at Republicans versus Democrats. You can look at Tories versus uh, um or versus Whigs if you look at it early on. And they're still English or American or whatever, they're not offering you something that's an incredibly radical transformation of society. I mean, even uh, even when Labour came onto the scene, a lot of the sort of welfare policies um, had already been tried at some point. You, um, and uh, w w what, what South Africa is different in is that you have a non-Western uh, society with its own value understandings of you know political values and engagements of engagement and uh far more collectivist uh far less accepting of um tensions and so on uh being vilt outsiders there's a big taboo in the anc that's not uh, it's um unique to, uh, to the anc you can see it in other liberation parties but you can also see it in um, you can also see a lot of African politics in general, even in places which haven't gone through a Marxist phase. Is the general thing of well, you know, we've got a consensus, and you know, the outsiders are not supposed to see that we're fighting, um, and so the ANC's got this. It, it, it becomes what, what a lot of people sort of see as an emerter culture, you know, in the ANC. But generally speaking, people vote for the ANC because they're looking. Okay, we're voting for democracy. We want this democracy thing to keep happening right and in their minds the only thing they have to contrast this with is apartheid they don't have any concept of any alternative political arrangement of any kind and so what they keep voting for is for the dispensation 
And when people get sick of it, they're not going to go vote for the DA because they're convinced the DA will bring back in white rule and whether this brings back apartheid as such or whether it brings back some sort of disguised crypto apartheid, they don't they don't they see it as voting for white people, white rule. And so this is never gonna happen. The South Africans are never gonna vote for the DA. They never were. Um and you you know the this is the core of the issue. We talk about, about identity politics, and it's because they, in general, people are voting according to their ethnic blocks because we know that the, these ethnic blocks in South Africa have utterly incommensurable social values. Um, and so, you know, the the, the, ends, the, the, the elite that's still holding onto the civil service a little bit and to some extent parts of the upper echelons, the ANC, still believe in things like, you know, uh, due process and... Um, and procedural democracy and all of the things that they inherited from the British imperial tradition. But um, increasingly they're skeptical of this because their own intellectuals are finally passing through higher education and encounter philosophical questions. And what this means is that increasingly you'll see them reject all of the, the, the ancient liberties that the English have passed on to South Africans. Uh, and so, and I mean, you, you you consult any intellectual, and they sort of, or, or any radical black radical it, from from any sort of uh, educational background, they'll they'll point out, well, you know, what's Roman Dutch law? What is English common law? These are foreign impositions. We need to find some other alternative rule of engagement. And increasingly, they turn to the people who've gone about trying to dismantle the English, the the European political order and so you end up with you end up with the kind of silliness that that you know Europeans <laughs> you end up with the kind of silly criticisms that European leftists have come up with um, so yeah. the, the, the really there really are levels at which people are relatively incommensurate if 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 Western education was far more you know penetrative and the um, and the education system in South Africa had one run very well, I think we'd see something different. I think that the um, the sort of Western institutional ideas would be far deeper ingrained in the society, and you'd see far less of a breakup of um, uh, of the community. But that hasn't happened. The ANC put no effort into fixing, uh, doing anything properly. I mean, uh, when people say they get, got a better life, I mean, you can almost entirely chalk that up to um, the the remnants of the old civil service and the fact that South Africa had uh, became a boon for investment um, after opening up. Um, I mean, it didn't take very long. It didn't even take a decade for it to turn around and become, you know, start nosediving. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Any, any of that sort of hope? People are just turning to not voting. And the people who don't vote say, okay, well, voting doesn't work. Let's have an entirely new method of political engagement. Forget voting. We protest now. We use violence. We use intimidation. So that's that was, that's that's really how I see the voting thing going. Because no one's really uh, voting for EFF, to be frank. Yeah, uh, Russell, you and Rob uh, actually mentioned something that I think is very important, and that's this whole... Uh, culture that's all the cultural roots actually of uh, voting for the ANC. So in South Africa, you have a struggle culture. I mean, any culture has its origin myths, any culture has its roots in its, uh, in its mythical past. And uh, what we have in South Africa is this, uh, this past where all the heroes of your culture are from that struggle period, all your, your songs that you sing. For example, in Africana culture, our songs uh, also uh, originate in our, our epochs of our culture and all the, the great events in our culture. So you, the yeah. songs that you sing also uh, connect you to the past. And all the songs that are sung by ANC voters uh, are pretty much struggle songs. They aren't songs of the new South Africa. They're mm -hmm. songs of where they are still fighting the apartheid regime during the Cold War. And you can see it with the, the ANC politicians calling themselves comrade as well. Uh, I mean, that's still also a relic from the past and shows where their the cultural mentality is still at. So when it comes to the ANC voter base, you pretty much have uh, 
the ANC becoming a cultural party and a cultural icon. It embodies that culture that we see in South Africa, the struggle culture. And uh, and I think that's actually one of the big drivers, and you touched on it, uh, Russell, uh, that people miss. So when they look at the ANC and they say, well, well, why do they still have voters? A lot of people just have the knee-jerk response of, oh, it's because they're uneducated, it's because they don't know better, it's because they're uninformed. But that's a very superficial analysis. You, you still see if yeah. you take a very good, uh, if you do an analysis of the ANC voter base, you'll see that a very large chunk of those voters know exactly what's going on, but they're voting for other reasons. Therefore, we need to get to the bottom of what those reasons are to make more sense of the picture. And there's definitely this cultural element. Something else that I just find very funny is, uh, and I think I've talked to Rob about this in private, is the, the DA uh, as a party in South Africa is just a fascinating anomaly. They're pretty much this, these cookie cutter, perfect example of a European social democrat party. They have all the aesthetics of the EU. They pretty much, their rhetoric matches mm. the social democrat party in, the, in Europe. Uh, with a little bit of United States liberalism thrown in, but they're just this anomaly in Africa. They just stand out like a sore thumb. You don't see their counterparts anywhere else on the continent. They're just this strange, almost as you know, those stories of when uh, people look at old photographs and they see like a guy wearing jeans and a T-shirt in like the 1800s and they say it's a time traveler. Well, if you look at... Uh, yeah. The DA in South Africa, it is just this historical anomaly. It's something, one of these things is not like the others. Something, it's something that shouldn't be here in the bigger picture. It just stands out. And I just find that very funny every time I see their rhetoric or their, their campaigns hmm. and their, but their aesthetics. But, it, but it's, you see, it's, it's here for a reason. And, and I mean, to be blunt, I mean, the, the DA is, is here to represent, um, ethnic minority ethnic minorities it's it's here to represent in the broadest sense whites but particularly um anglos um it's managed to get indian south africans on board and it represents um more westernized uh, colored communities um and afrikaners go with the da because they sense that it's um it's a it's a powerful uh, opposition that they can identify with at a let's call it civilizational level that they can identify with as westerners it's not an afrocentric party if you go high up the da ranks you're engaging with english south africans uh yeah. there's a few afrikaners mm -hmm. in the ranks um you know th there's there's some colored people in the ranks but it's it's essentially a an anglo south african um sort of representation um, and it exists because there's a large constituency of of Westerners and and racial minorities in South Africa, as opposed to uh, much of the rest of rest of Africa. Certainly, a large non-African uh, population. And by African, you know, I, I think this word African gets gets a little bit distorted and misunderstood. There's 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 being geographically African, which is what we are. We are natively African by geography, but we're not African by culture um uh, th there is there is a civilizational africanism and there is a civilizational westernism or occidentalism or or, or europeanism um and that is where you know the overwhelming you know 99.9 percent .9 of white south africans are going to culturally identify with um, indian south africans are going to identify with with you know, uh, some sort of hybrid, I suppose, of Hindu and, and Western culture. Um, but this is very, very different to Nguni culture and to, to you know, Sutu and Swana and, and, you know, Sepedi culture and so on. So, you know, I, 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 just, I just think that um, we've got to sort of call a spade a spade on this stuff. You know, um, people, vote, people vote very overwhelmingly in these kind of cultural civilizational blocks. Um, there's there's not a perfect correlation between these things there's there's some splits within the african voting bloc towards the eff but if you go into eff support it's largely the northern provinces of the country it's largely the northwest the limpopo uh, regions um the ifp is a is a zulu party uh, but not all zulus vote for the ifp so there's there's you know there's 
it gets complicated. Yeah. And of course, what you see with a party like the DA is the minute they try to court um, a more African flavor into the party, the minute they try to Africanize the DA because they and believe that that's the way, because they believe that that's the way to win national elections, they then get abandoned by the their most tenuous support, which would be um, which would largely be, I suppose, you know, conservative and traditionalist Afrikaners who who, who don't want an Africanized party, um, and um, and the DA's core voter base is really urban English South Africans who kind of also don't want an Africanized party, but they kind of think that the DA has a chance of winning the national election, and therefore, if it gets a black leader and and does some African things and becomes a sort of African party. Then it can it can win elections and so on. It's it's a to my mind an incredibly confused political uh, landscape when you look at it in those terms. Once you begin to understand that, as Samuel Huntington speaks about very very brilliantly in his 1993 essay, that that we live in South Africa in the clash of civilizations. We don't live just with cultural um, incongruities. Um, Although those are certainly there, but at the level above culture, you get what might what one might call civilization. You know, within Western civilization, you have Germanic culture, you have you have Latin culture, you have um, you have you know Gallic culture, you have you have Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, but those form those then aggregate out into a broader Western cultural block, which which would be defined by by Christianity, you have a Protestant Northern Europe, you have a Catholic Southern Europe. Those are that's another level of divide. You have you have Slavic civilization and and the Orthodox uh, world. You have Islamic civilization, and then you come in and, and you have African civilization. And then within Africa, you're going to get all sorts of cultural divides. And the idea that we can just throw all those together um, and create this wonderful uh, synthesis is the essence of the, the South African dream that I think most people are now starting to realize um, is just unworkable. And it's, and it's you know, it, it, in many ways, it's, it's, it's the hubris of South African exceptionalism to think that um, we can have 11 different languages, 11 official languages, you know, underneath or, or sitting on top of those 11 languages at least at least five or six, maybe more um, sort of strong cultural blocks, maybe 11 cultural blocks in a sense, um, and, and throw that in, into one constitutional order um, with all its competing norms and mores and, and systems of morality. Um, so I think that's just totally unworkable. Final thing before I, before I pass on to, to, the, to you guys, you know, you, you spoke about the history of struggle but that's not unique to to black South Africans. The Afrikaner very strongly defines himself in in struggle. Um, the Afrikaner takes his identity as an as a as a nation mo mostly from the nineteenth century, not the twentieth century. Uh, in terms of in terms of those founding uh, uh, sort of events of the Afrikaner nation, of course, the twentieth century was a was a century in which the Afrikaner consolidates. Um, cultural power and 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 so on, but really, it's that struggle of and that adversity of the 19th century that forges that nation. Um, it's one of the reasons why English South Africans um, have such an incoherent uh, sort of cultural identity. Um, not only do they are they formed from so many disparate groups, um, but they really lack. A kind of history of of um, of being the underdog and, and significant adversity, um, and and the final point I'll just make on 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 what you said is that um, when you have these competing cultures, you have competing histories. You know, <laughs> people don't like this, but um, the fact of the matter is that so much of history is a kind of relativistic game. Uh, it, it is very, very difficult to get a proud Zulu and a proud Afrikaner to agree on a common meaning of the Battle of Blood River. You know, 
to agree on a common narrative about that particular historical context. For some people, uh, Dingon will always be a treacherous person. And for other people, he will be a hero because he was able to, uh, to make a play in defending his homeland against, against you know, a group that was obviously in the long run trying to invade. And you are not going to, to uh, reconcile those perspectives. And when we talk about different historical perspectives, it is so, so deep and so important that most societies that have been unable to agree on history have decided to draw a border between them, between themselves. Mm. Um, there's no way that you will get uh, Turks and Armenians to agree on the meaning of their history and on the interpretation of, of, of their common history. Um, and so, you know, I, I just think that uh, when, when Cyril Ramaphosa gets up on the 16th of December and gives yet another divisive speech and Afrikaners are angry and there's articles and his tweets and there's all this kind of stuff. It's so tiresome because, um, w you know, to my mind, we're never going to get those stories aligned and that's okay. But then, you know, then one's got to stop pretending that one can, can share a kind of, uh, politico legal sort of moral, um, uh, domain with the the person that that disagrees so vehemently with you on the history and and this is why the world is made up of of um bounded uh domains of uh of cultural cooperation and and where those boundaries end we draw borders and then we and then we institute um peaceful dip, uh, diplomacy and 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 good relations uh, in a proper diplomatic way um, and that doesn't always work and sometimes people fight wars nonetheless and there's this this competition for resources and so on but you know to me this is just kind of such obvious stuff um, it's it's how the thousands of years of history that we can record have played out um, and South Africa got caught up in this hyper modernistic uh, multicultural ideology in in the in the nineties as as the Soviet Union unraveled and in many ways South Africa to my mind is a kind of victim of that globalistic um, order that was so dominant in the 90s. Um, you know, and that really shaped how Codessa played out. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm, it, it's sad because I think we could have, we could have negotiated a, a, a far more innovative and, and um, lasting order than we ended up uh, negotiating. And I hope that South Africans can start to to see this now and and kind of mutually work towards a better a better order than than the one we settled on in 1994. Mm. Mm, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a hidden dimension here that we're not considering, and that is empire. And I think that every player in the system actually, at, at, at on some level, understands what it means. So. Um, what you're going to notice is that South Africa was united um, in part by British military power and in part by uh, the administrative collaboration of Jan Smuts. Uh, people, uh, I, I'm, I, I beat this idea to death, but Jan Smuts really did design the whole country. He designed every aspect of it. Um, and he designed it on the basis of a really highfalutin political ideology that, I mean, it's like this really, really abstract um, philosophical system that's base, uh, that, that's sort of related to German idealism by way of Walt Whitman. And it's, you know, this gr great homogenous system where all aspects of life and, uh, and matter and mind are evolving together towards one holistic complex interlocking whole and the apex of this um, sort of dysentropic pyramid is the League of Nations which of course so his system builds towards saying that the the functional essence of nature is to create global governance this is like the entire of the human spirit and interestingly enough uh, the unity in diversity, which is on our 
buggering motto. That actually is the motto of UNESCO, which is uh, which was designed as a mechanism for uh, social engineering in order to uh, manipulate most of humanity into forming a single cohesive uh, political unit under the control of the sort of um, major financial and, and um, economic power centers in the United States and Western Europe, although predominantly the Anglo-American establishment. And uh, the, 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 their idea, and so what you see, I mean, when we're, we're sitting here talking about shit like um, y y uh, uh, wokeness and identity politics, was designed by the, the that stuff was commissioned. It was, I mean, it mostly comes out of critical theory. The original sort of precursors to this comes from a chunk of people called the Frankfurt School, who were sponsored by the OSS, precursor to the TIA, in order to design um, an ideology that would be based for denazification, which was a totalitarian program for. Um, instilling in Germans, um, because at the time the, the, the dominant idea amongst English governors was that there's an essence to German thinking, which they used to refer to as Germanism, which inevitably condemned them to always be building aggressive outward totalitarian societies. And so they had to be, uh, they had to be beaten down ideologically. Now, the lessons for this got reincorporated into UNESCO's um, systems and became the official uh, research methodology of the Social Science Research Center in the United States and of UNESCO more generally, which established um, the, the highest prestige for, for, uh, for, for studying in the humanities across the globe. Of course, um, this received a little bit of pushback from non-Western members of the UN, and so they struck a compromise in the 1970s where they would restrict this to criticizing Western culture. Um, the, the basic idea is to sort of gradually build a body of knowledge that would attack all of the things that allow nationalism to persist because nationalism poses the threat of war. But interestingly enough, it doesn't just pose a threat of war, it poses a threat to international trade and the profits of the global financial system. So you've got to see this as uh, you've got to see the, the this as a sort of the, this as a sort of successor to the British Empire in a manner of speaking and there are a lot of governors at the time particularly uh, governors uh, administrators at the time many of them from the round table group which is the secret society that um, was set up by Cecil Rhodes with funding from um, people like Nathan Rothschild um, their lot sort of had this general idea that by formally giving African nations independence, they could actually shift to to uh, governing at a distance through financial institutions, which is very much what did. And the primary example of how to do this is probably uh, Tiny Roland. So Tiny Roland did a lot of gallivanting all over Africa, and he encouraged socialist parties to take power. And once they've taken power, there's a single point of access for patronage to the, uh, in the economy, and you can basically capture the entire economy by negotiating with the leader, as he did in Ghana. Um, and he he was a, he was sponsored and supported by MI5. So I mean, you have the sort of uh, these these sort of informal and large networks of influence um, through global institutions and um, North Atlantic uh, security apparatus um, and for the most part continental Europe doesn't really participate except for the Netherlands um, and then only through the financial institutions. Um, France still has its own backyard in North Africa, but that's about it. Um, it's mainly the United States and the United Kingdom um, that do this kind of stuff. They stepped in to negotiate South African settlement in, 19, in the 1990s. Um, but not just them. There were also some local billionaires like uh, like Oppen uh, like Mr. Oppenheimer, uh, who'd been, uh, as it turns out, spurring the ANC since the 1960s, as he bragged um, about um, in the early 90s. Um, and generally speaking, the problem was our Afrikaans nationalism, which you know dovetails with the the anti-nationalist uh, stuff that they're dealing with. Now, the the reason that South Africa became such a mess is precisely because of what Jan Smuts was doing. 
he was trying to demonstrate to um, to his allies in the international sphere that he could create, and this is partially why he was included into so many um, treaties and so many um, international organizations, is that his philosophy reflected their outlook. His strategies for governance reflected their hopes. He hoped that by giving South Africa a unitary government, he would gradually drag South Africa towards unity. And so what he did is he, he um, but obviously for practical reasons, you couldn't include the black portion of the population into the white. Uh, into the white. Um, but at the same time, he couldn't afford to shut out the working class because of the Rand Rebellion. So he struck the uh, he struck uh, the he struck one compromise first, which shaped the next. So his first compromise with the Rand Rebellion says, "Okay, the white working class, the the, the white communist, the the South African Communist Party, who lobbied for a white only South Africa and wanted to keep the African parts of the territory at bay." Um, they they were appeased by being given the vote. Once they'd been given the vote, then you're stuck with this question of, okay, well, now you can't have the old trusteeship system where you gradually integrate Africans as they enter um, the middle class, the property-owning classes, because you can't justify the two different systems. So they tried to have, they tried to have, a, have their cake and eat it too by having parallel states within a state. Um, and then, of course, in order to prevent, uh, in order to prevent it from being broken up because it was very profitable, uh, businesses and uh, so on encouraged immigration from the British Empire, and they encouraged immigration from the uh, for, from the Bantustans, and that forced a stalemate because they because the authorities weren't ready to commit the levels of violence and property sacrifice in order to um, balkanize uh, the imperial territory. And so now we're dealing with, you know, uh, now we're dealing with the, the, the actual problem, which is there is no compatibility. And within any one polity, there will be one culture. And the ANC has demonstrated a structural reluctance to completely dedicate themselves to UNESCO's um, bizarre, um, hyper-progressive, um, sort of technocratic human engineering program. And they also aren't enti uh, entirely committed to communism anymore. Um, what they do have is a ring ethnic grudge. And the, the, cultural, uh, the cultural sort of concept of Ubuntu, which is often understood by the, by the Anglos as being that very sort of, we are all one, we are one, you know, that sort of like liberal communist Fabian uh, somehow almost every white Anglo has adopted. Um, th that, you know, that is what they project when they see Ubuntu. But in reality, Ubuntu is closer to fascism. Ubuntu is a concept that we, ha we as a community must show solidarity with one another. And um, it means uh, it's also, it's also a uh, concept of consensus politics. The practices that surround the the concepts of identity and community in um, in Bantu communities, particularly in the south, include weird practices like if you're referring to people who are not members of your group, you use um, well, I can't really call them pronouns because grammatically that doesn't really map. But you use particles, use uh, noun classes. That's the word. Um, use noun classes to refer to them that mean this uh, that mean that they're animals or inanimate objects so you won't say ba zulu you would say le zulu right if you were said so on example and so um in general you you have these ingrained practices where the in group and the out group are separated and how this is translated we often look at struggle uh, we often look at struggle ideology and think okay there's a socialism the ANC are common no no no, no. They inherited far more of their pre-colonial culture than we actually give them credit for. If you look at the Freedom Charter, they don't say, okay, the state will own everything in the Stalinist sense. Their biggest move on property was actually to guarantee everyone the right to settle where they like. Now, what that is, is it's a return to a half-preserved uh, half memory of how things, use, uh, of how things functioned in the tribal areas, where you have a central authority that allocates grazing land 
um, and manage you know groups of people who move in and out of the territory um, temporarily because of marriage or whatever. The land is owned by the the executive authority who apportions these things temporarily. But generally speaking, there's enough room for everybody because South Africa is three times the size of Germany, and a hundred years ago had you know like what was it, what was it ten fifteen million people in it. So um, you, the, the enormous amount of space is just unimaginable. That's not possible now. All land is enclosed, um, and uh, Population density requires uh, vertically integrated industrial agriculture. So, this is the f this is absolutely foolish. But the other, I mean, th these these ways of thinking include the Ubuntu thing is translated into. You can see it in the thought of Steve Biko, and you can see it in the thoughts of the ANC, particularly in the Morogoro conference. And the Morogoro conference, they reached a, a decision. Uh, in which uh, the leadership, the executive branch of the party, would, would not allow in any colored or Indians. So they can be allies, but they're not actually fully black. And for Steve Biko, you've got this idea of um, policy being um, matching your your race. So you're politically black if you're demonstrated to be loyal, and so on and so forth. But he betrays how he actually thinks about these racial groups because there's this one, uh, there's this general idea that oh well, if you're a person of color and you show loyalty uh, loyalty by hating white people and fighting against them, um, then you know that's fine. Then you're black. But this is not really the case. This sort of um, hidden otherness that that the, the um, where you're where you're subordinated to the uh, to the higher group. Um, this is shown in practice. This is shown in practice um, quite often. Everyone knows that coloured and Indian members of of African nationalist organisations are not seen quite the same way. But Steve Biko phrased it perfectly. Uh, his, his, his this attitude perfectly. He said, um, uh, "You know, white people are not really particularly human. They're very cold. We don't understand art or dance or affection or community. We're sort of like these cold, calculating machines." But and Africans are the most human and the most compassionate and so on. And then he says, colored and Indian people have some of these qualities, and only by integrating themselves with the African culture they become fully human. So there's this humanness quality that is the the thing of Ubuntu. It's it's deciding who is fully human based on in group membership, um, and that is high. That is. That is something, if you want to see a really deep example of that, you can look at the Tosa. So the Tosa have, uh, they, they were started by a, uh, a, tri a small tribe that were called the Chawe. And the Chawe beca became the, the aristocratic class, the rule for the whole, uh, the, the whole sort of population. And generally speaking, their ethnic group became the one, the, it, it was a lot like the Tutsi in Rwanda. You get this one ethnic group that you can come part of by marrying um, and that is it's instantiated as the, the the top group, and everyone's got to deal with it. But we're really all one people. That kind of thing. Like you'll you'll see it. But this is not just African. You can see it European empire building as well. So the Portuguese would pretend that their empire was all one. The British will say, "Ah, oh, look how wonderful and diverse and." unified this global empire is and the reality is that th 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 there's a permeable barrier um and yeah th there's no th there's no real sort of nice end to this power politics and identity politics are universal there is no yeah there's and, there's and, no and alternative think, to this. just just to jump in there i mean i think you you can tell you can tell a lot of um you you can go through a lot of the specifics of South Africa's situation, and indeed you must, and you're very you're very good at it, Rob. But it, at the end of the day, it's mm -hmm. universal stuff, isn't it? It's 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 these things have they might have had some very specific instantiations in South Africa, but you can find yes. the same sorts of stories all over the world, and um, what the South African project has. Has tried to do is to is to try. I mean, 1994 
when you look at it in this context was just an extremely radical uh, settlement, right? It was this idea mm. that that we can we can brush away these these very very deep uh, differences um, that we can have a kind of on the surface everyone's an equal citizen but then also have a dominant culture that then dominates the political space, just like Rob's described, um, and that everyone would be would be happy with it. Actually, I, I must interrupt there because that's actually not what, what, what was expressed. There is a, it, it, what was expressed is that we would be equal and we would be one. Now, we know that this is not true. This is not practicable. No, I mean, there are a lot of there are a few sort of foolish people who still hang on this idea but i think look i mean this is this is my really radical thesis is that the modern democratic south africa is actually the culmination of jan smuts's political theory it's finally what he was intending to do and what he admitted that he was intending to do uh, in response to the fagan report back in 1948 um was that the end goal is to integrate a single policy. And this is about it being a microcosm of the planet. The idea is to have a single global polity that will have a sing an integrated global culture. Now, yeah. the, this is why South Africa is now, of course, in my opinion, the most important country in the world, because it yeah. signifies to the rest of the world, the success or failure of the philosophy that underpins the greatest empire that has ever existed in world history, that of the United Nations, which is run by the Anglo-American establishment. And so the success or failure of this project is an indicative one of them. So, Rob, Rob, Rob if, I could know, just, if, if I could just draw hmm. what you're saying into, into stark relief, this project... Yeah. Um, Sorry, sorry. This 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 project that you're that you're talking about, um, you know, it it couldn't be a bigger divide right now in 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 the world. Some people believe that this this globalistic project, of which you're perfectly correct in saying that South Africa is a precursor and a kind of microcosm of. Some people yeah. believe that this is truly an inevitable and inexorable and 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 desirable hugely desirable political future and it's not that the opposition that i suppose we represent is thinks that it's it's not quite those things or it's you know if you tweak it a little bit um you can you can salvage some of it i mean we think that it's actually a recipe for for total chaos and I mean, I think we're seeing it. I think we're seeing it. We're, we're certainly seeing the rise of chaos in, in the South African polity. Um, the scenes that you see, uh, you know, in, in Pete Retief this week are, are the rise of, of this chaos that that emerges from these kinds of systems. What what you've seen in America in the last year, what you've seen with, with BLM riots, what you're seeing with the way... Uh, globalistic financial systems are being managed um so so your point earlier was that that this was all about um discrediting nationalism and sort of denazifying uh, running as far away from nazism yeah. as you possibly could right um yeah. because then we wouldn't fight wars um and what we're going to discover is that we, mm. we, we may be marching ourselves into the the greatest most uh, most awful conflicts um, that could ever be imagined by 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 sort of trying to fashion yeah. this this sort of world, and so it's important that we draw that distinction that we don't just think this is a an ill conceived project. We think it's 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 got the potential to to destroy, you know, to to really be immensely yeah. destructive, and I and I think you to a large extent we're seeing that with the way South Africa has is shaping out. Things are not pretty out there. It, it, it's getting ugly, um, and it's getting tense, and and, the, and and the tensions are, you know, are immense. Well, I mean, the thing is that there's a phrase. I don't know if you remember, you guys. I don't know if you guys remember one of the the, the Matrix sequels. Is that but where they're interviewing the where, where he's in that room with 
architect, not architect. Um, and he says, you know, trying to convince him to uh, to take the deal and let the system sort of resolve itself. You, you know, it's like thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Let's keep playing this Hegelian game of of infinite progress, right? Um, and he says, well, what if I say no and, you know, and let your whole system die? And he says to Neo, he says, there are levels of existence that we are willing to accept. And what you have to realize is with empires is that whoever in, is sitting in the ruling class is willing to accept whatever pain is required to inflict on the masses in order to maintain their power and control. If you look at China right now, China's ruling families, 85% of the ruling class, are the same families who were in power during the Qing Dynasty. All of that terror, chaos, revolution, and upheaval did nothing to upset that apple cart. If you look at the big, uh, big power players, transatlantic um, capital, it's still members of the old European aristocracy. They didn't get chucked out by, um, by all of those waves of revolutions. They shifted out into different organizations. The only nation whose uh, whose democracy was completely defeated was Russia's. So, uh, I mean, you can see this if you look at the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission and all these people. The membership includes a lot of a lot of aristocrats. So, w what this sort of the the sort of ruling class that's sort of increasingly detached from legible institutions that is institutions only people can see. They're willing to be more civil in the way that they wield power. Um, and in the United States, we, we look at all of the riots and funny things, and there's little bits where you can actually see that there's a degree of control. I don't say that they have a, a total control, but they have some degree of control that they can sometimes. And I think that they, they, they demonstrated this um, with the level of coordination that was boasted about in two major mainstream publications, that's the Times, uh, so the New York Times and Time Magazine. So New York Times in um, in January there was an article called "How Democrats Prepared for Doomsday," and there's another one in Time called something about how they fortified the election. So what they did is the it, the, the the most the most revealing one for me was actually not so much the fortify the election one because they say oh. Look how tricksy we were in slightly unconstitutionally uh, basically changing all of the rules of the election so Trump couldn't get elected. Um, you know, getting rid of oversight criteria and all kinds of things like that. That one, that one's par for the course. But the one that was really spooky is when you look at the um, the, the the one about January the sixth, how the Democrats prepared for doomsday. They it, they boast that in a single conference call with about 900 participants they contacted every protest group in the entire United States and got them to stand down that's all of the people who are burning cities the whole of last year right all of those people were just told stay at home for January the 6th and they stayed home so what, what's interesting to me is w w the level of coordination between the Democratic Party apparatus this demonstrates, because now we, we in South Africa recognize this behavior. This is how the ANC and the EFF conduct their, their protests. They, find that they have a whole bunch of books of loyal supporters who will be working to whatever kind of organized violence they want, and they bust them in. Okay. And they use this method to compete for uh, internally for patronage and control of different districts. So we know that this happens in South Africa. The Western world thinks it's impossible. They think that all of this kind of stuff is conspiracy theories, but it's normal behavior in South Africa that everyone is aware of. So what people are willing to do to hold on to power is they're willing to destroy every institution that sustains the life and welfare of any ordinary person. And so for me, what this really comes down to is when you're looking at how bad the competition can be for control and security amongst people, it can be existential. 
and the people who are who have the power to participate at a higher level they have no skin in the game and they have not a care in the world how much it hurts you but that's i mean so this, is, this is precisely this get very messy this is this is precisely why politics as usual with the usual talking points and trying to get as many votes as you can you know, the da trying to get as many votes as it can at the next election and and pretending that it can uh well pre pretending that it can overturn um the, the dominant order um is is silly and and, and we, people have got to stop being so naive about the nature of of the game um people think that we're one you know good uh constitutional court decision away from from changing the the stakes and and moving in, in the right direction um and as course milan will tell will tell us um you know that's uh, that's deeply naive you know we, we we've got a a cultural elite that's now in charge of the courts and they interpret the new dispensation in a particular way that is that is not the way that um western south africans interpret it and one can go on and on with this kind of with this kind of stuff so we've got to stop being so naive so politically yeah. naive in this country well it's not the, it's not the constitution that holds all the power it's who <clears throat> it's whoever is interpreting the constitution and uh, the current situation that we're we're finding ourselves in is that every south african election as flip base puts it is just a demographic census and uh i don't i'm not completely on board with the the scenario planners and the analysts saying well 2024 is the year that the anc is finally going to meet its match and uh that's the the year the last election that the anc is uh we're going to see with the anc uh, i think as we've discussed already on the stream <clears throat> excuse me that is something we're going to see the anc in power is something we're going to see for the foreseeable future and uh, the <clears throat> what well, we're currently the paradigm that we're finding ourselves in is the previous paradigm was a paradigm of forced separation by coercion through coercion of the state the current paradigm in south africa is forced integration through uh, state coercion and uh, we've seen the fruits of both those uh, experiments we've seen the through fruits of both those paradigms the current paradigm we're still stuck yeah. in and uh, what we're seeing here is pretty much the logic that uh, the state will be the judge, jury, executioner, and the babysitter, and it will keep all these different cultures and religions apart and make sure that it will solve all the disputes between them. And uh, it will pretty much be the, the guardian of society. But as soon as the state uh, is not on its guard, mm. or as soon as uh, the state becomes corrupt, or when the state starts losing a bit of its power, uh, the inevitable nature inevitable result will be culture will start retaking that lost ground that the state has taken from it it will be like uh, the like weeds and nature takes back an old building that's not being maintained um and that's what, what mm. we're going to see so i think one of the a lot of the questions in the chat have centered around but what is the solution then for the future what where do we then find what should we focus on and how do we combat this uh, current paradigm and uh, I'll give it over to you, Russell, to maybe uh, lead us into that final question for discussion. Well, again, it's extremely complicated. I mean, the, the easy answer is to is to use words like um, self determination, uh, political autonomy, um, to to be able to create some sort of decentralized order, uh, secessionism. Um, those are great buzzwords and we can we can sort of try and fashion uh specifics around what that could look like um the reality is that, is that those things are going to be extremely extremely difficult what what uh a orderly breakup if it's possible of the country uh requires is for real genuine popular legitimacy for for it um and you know so so when people talk about cape independence um they then talk about well is it economically viable and what does the law say and all this kind of stuff and those are sort of proximate questions but the ultimate question is do do you get do you get popular legitimate buy-in 
from most importantly colored you know colored people in the cape first and foremost because they form the the certainly the yeah the majority population if not uh, maybe the plurality of of the population um and you need you need to have a groundswell of of uh strong political passion for for that order i suppose my concern in the short term for south africa is that uh, this kind of discourse is so fringe that I'm worried that we don't, uh, we haven't cultivated in the last 25 years a sufficiently large groundswell of of support and of um, of legitimacy for for a breakup, for a, for an orderly breakup of the country, and at the very least a a deep devolution of power. Now, of course. The one thing that that requires is for the ANC to relinquish it, and they're not going to want to do that, right? So, so we've got to also stop being naive and just sort of wishing this into existence. It's got there's there's got to be some tangible praxis here, where where power blocks, where where a, where a where a powerful coalition um, actually starts to to leverage credible threats against the ANC or toward the ANC. Um, and that's that's going to take a lot of hard work um, to get that done. So so these these things in theory are wonderful. I think South Africa would benefit tremendously from an orderly breakup into into its large kind of let's say ethnic constituencies. The Cape would be would be a a, a, a tricky a tricky country to 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 get right because what you don't want to do is replicate you know the rainbow. Uh, order you oh, don't yeah. want to go rainbow 2.0 no in real terms of, rainbow nation has never been tried you, you, you don't want to go you don't want to go with the when, when i say you don't want rainbow you don't no. want the 1994 settlement just rehashed with a with a with a cleaner government you know it, it's it's only going to devolve once again into into the same sorts of problems so it has to be a crafting a very very careful and clever crafting of a political order that that generates genuine peace and goodwill between the different uh, cultural communities that allows them significant autonomy, um, something that approximates a, a Swiss type type Canton system, you know, is great. But obviously, that's going to have to have to be instantiated very particularly in, in a Cape uh, context. Um, and of course, th there's all sorts of uh, complexities around what what a place like Gauteng would look like, which is this this extremely cosmopolitan sort of place. Um, but but KwaZulu KwaZulu Natal um, is is overwhelmingly Zulu, um, but that leaves that that puts Indian South Africans, for example, and and you know parts of the white uh, cultural community. Um, in significant disadvantage in 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 that region and they would have to then make decisions about whether they move or how they get to politically express themselves in those contexts where we are right now um this is heading towards i mean the end game here guys is that the minorities leave right that's that's how this goes if you don't solve this problem yep. sooner or later the minorities go um, that is the story of Africa, um, is the story of, of um, these hegemonic uh, dominant sort of, sort of ethnic orders where you have uh, uh, resentment towards you know, very culturally different minorities. And the end game here is if we don't sort this out, you know, people leave. Uh, they, they depopulate the region yeah, the and they go and join. Expansion. And they go and, and they go and they go and so, look for a more sure cultural footing somewhere else in the world, and that's of course what South African immigration has been all about since since about 1980. And if we're going to stop that trend, um, we have to we have to reimagine the politics of this country almost from the ground up in in ways that we're probably a little bit uncomfortable with now and and, and aren't easy to to articulate because because we haven't even fully thought through what this whole thing needs to look like and and that's one of the reasons why uh, south africa as rob said is one of the most important countries in the world right now i mean this this isn't just south african parochial hu hubris here we really are a kind of very very interesting um lab experiment for for this 
for this globalistic um, multicultural project and it's unwinding and it's and it's uh, it's reorganization into something far more sensible absolutely uh, russell i think that's an excellent uh, final thought from you uh, same question to you rob a lot of people are asking so what is the solution now, i'm not uh, expecting you to give some grand solution but what are some things that people can make some ideas to keep at the back of their minds and then also just uh, you can incorporate that into your final thoughts as well Well, I mean, one of the things that you have to bear in mind is that most of us have no say in anything that happens in politics. Politics is decided by elites. Uh, the, 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 the sort of economic and the serious power elites, tiny, tiny fraction of people. But there is a sort of middle elite who consist of people who have a certain ideological outlook. They tend to be middle class. Um, their opinions matter a great deal, but in South Africa, they tend to be um, either Anglos or black nationalists. Uh, the Afrikaners are largely shut out of the political process. Um, and so they've funneled themselves into Afri Forum and the Solidarität Bewegung, and they get to do a lot of productive in, in, innovative things there, but they're not running any part of the country um, except un informally. Um, so, the people really playing the game are actually the English elite in the Democratic Alliance. And those people are, they run, they run from a sort of English colonialist, uh, sort of like slight nostalgia for English colonialism, classic liberals, to communists who don't trust the ANC. And so, you know, in between this, you've got um, you've got the, the big thing that defines oh, Russell's like a dog. <laughs> right. Um, but in between it, you you you've got you've got a few uniting factors, and I think the big thing is that English South Africans identify themselves with the state of South Africa, um, but their culture is entirely determined by what happens in Britain and America entirely aside from like some kind of patronizing um absorptions of local african cultures for for its fashion for its sort of fashion and its ability to signal noblesse oblige um anglos are largely still psychologically foreigners they consider uh, as a minority that they, they, they they can't really ever be full sort of members of society in a complete way um they're still completely westernized all the music that english south africans listen to is you know it's westernized pop music and so on and what this means is that their, their ideas are easily influenced by what's going on overseas and so they'll be sort of they'll look like anglo conservatives or they'll look like anglo leftists and so largely the ability whether or not something manages to win or lose comes down to whether or not you can convince a large pocket of people in this liberal unity to accept an alternative nexus of identification and submit to a different moral order because the current moral order that they embrace is a nihilistic one it's that of um, a progressive liberalism that doesn't really understand where it's going, except that it wants to increase autonomy. And uh, as there was an inter there's a very, very fascinating thinker that I think everyone should up uh, on. Um, oh, sure, but I, I, he's just goes by Apex on Twitter. I've forgotten his name. But he had this interesting theory that what leftism is, and English liberalism really is just sort of progressive, it, it is a leftward progression. One thing that keeps trying to increase is, is autonomy, and that is to break down anything that would reduce the individual's ability to freely choose. But what that really does is it turns every relation in society into a pure market relationship. So what this means is that um, it's completely nihilistic, completely. Um, and what has to be realized is that the, 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 this dialectic of nihilism that progresses forward in society 
can only be arrested by an alternative moral scheme. It can only be arrested by an alternative faith. And so at some point they have to see the bottom coming up at them and they have to realize that these things are intrinsically connected. It is the values that they hold now that are driving them towards the bottom. And if they don't realize that, they'll be screwed forever because they're the ones pulling the strings at the moment. Uh, and on that cheerful note, uh, I think this conversation will be, have to be uh, continued on another day. Uh, Robin Russell, thank you very much uh, for your insights tonight. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy the conversation. The uh, people in the chat have also indicated that they all really much enjoyed it. Um, Thanks, if man. you like the, the insights from these two guests, the links to where you can find them and their work are in the description of the stream. Please go check it out. Go subscribe to uh, Rob's channel and go check out uh, Russell's uh, website as well and also his um, Twitter profile that's linked in the description. Thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. Thank you for taking the time out of your day for these long format conversations. I know it, uh, it takes a lot to sit down for more than an hour to listen to some uh, very dense and uh, but still interesting conversation, but uh, you guys still do it. And at the same time, also take part in the conversation with your questions and your comments. So thank you very much. You can also help out this channel if uh, you like these types of conversations and you'd like to hear more in the future you can click subscribe if you're not already you can also leave a like it'll help out the show and uh, tune in next week when i interview helen zilla about her new book uh, and how the our south africa is not going to survive the american culture war so that's yeah. going to be a very good one so cheers guys have a good one enjoy the rest of your evening and god bless <laughs>